This is the last sermon we're going to have on Gen 17. It's kind of a, um, a delight of mine because uh, well, it's just so rich. There's so much going on there. I could probably spend on there. I could probably spend a very long time breaking down every verse, every word, um, even further than we have. Uh, I already did the first five verses twice in this series once before we started our family stuff and the marriage and divorce. So that was about four months ago I did the first five verses. Then we started them again just recently. And now here we are at the end of John 17. So um, as I was reading the text and studying for our service this week, um, I realized there are times that we are blessed and with the privilege, uh, um, sorry my tongue tied there, to witness something um, not many people get to experience. Um, Each of us have different things in our lives that we have experienced that that may be, uh, that we've been given eyes to see and other people don't get to see some of those things and the power of the moment uh, really affects us. Uh, There's some things that all of us have got to be a part of in history, at, at least uh, it's, at some point, um, some of us have remember the, the Twin Tower attacks, and that's, I'm not only bringing that up because it's actually anniversary tomorrow, but um, that is one thing that's powerful that many of us are never going to forget. That's always a moment where you go, what were you doing? What happened? I remember where I was when I heard the news the first time and that kind of thing. Some of us have been privileged to remember uh, the moon landing um, and, and that whole period of time and, and what... The environment and the atmosphere was like, uh, you know, in the, in this in society in the country. Some of us might remember Pearl Harbor. Just the other day, I heard a, a recording of Charles Spurgeon's son from 1905, and they actually said that the technology was around to uh, record Charles Spurgeon's sermons in 1880 uh, to hear his the audio. Uh, he just never did it. Never took advantage of that. So that would have been. Neat to hear the Prince of Preachers from the 1800s, uh, kind of like our John MacArthur, uh, what, what like a lot of people say. Um, and a few disciples were there for the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ when he peeled back his flesh to reveal his divinity in, in a manner of speaking. We don't really know what that, uh, how that really played out. We weren't really there, and, and the disciples don't really go into graphic detail to just to tell us what that was actually like, but they were given those eyes to see at that time. And there's another one who I had, um, <clears throat> as I was studying this week, kind of a side note to all this, um, was Abraham and Lot. They got to experience something uh, very powerful that no one has really experienced since. And... Um, Abraham from the positive and Lot from the negative, right? Um, We're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction. Uh, Abraham uh, was on the side of watching it from afar and talking with the Lord about it on the the side of the mountain, as it were, as looking down over the uh, the, the valleys and the cities that were going to be destroyed. And Lot, from the negative side of that, who was on the inside of the deal and had to flee for his life and run with his family. Um, And I bring this up because recently, within the last, actually the last 16 years, but um, since about 2006, um, scientists now believe that they have actually discovered the site for Sodom. Uh, And with what I've studied over the last week, uh, and I know we're not really talking about that in our text, and I'll try to link what I'm saying in a second. But it's enough to um, understand how powerful this is, because uh, this was a massive event. This is a massive, massive event. Um, they have what they think is the positive ID uh, on this location. Um, just for some reference, um, one scientist, the one of the lead scientists, Dr. Stephen Collins, had this to say, and and this is the modern name of the of of what what they call what, what he's calling what they're calling Sodom. This is 
tell a, tell a Hamam. He says, if Tel Hamam is not Sodom, which all the geo indicators point to, then how can we say Jerusalem is Jerusalem? Put it another way, he said it like this. If Tel Hamam isn't Sodom, we might have to unidentify Jerusalem, modern Jerusalem as it is today. That's how many indicators they have to know that this is the precise location. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, the, the town of Jericho, which we know exists, there's only about seven or eight geographical indicators in the text that indicate where Jericho was, and we know positively now where that is. Jerusalem, on the other hand, has about 15 or 16 of those geographic indicators from the text. In other words, if you're following a map and you're going somewhere and the map says go left, go right, go here, go there, look for that, look for this, there's about 15 or 16 of those that mark Jerusalem. That's the second largest archaeological site that has the second largest amount of geographical points of reference. The number one is Sodom. There's 25. So, rightly so, if there's not, if that's not Sodom, then Jerusalem may have to be unidentified or re-identified. And, and, and that's all to point to the fact that what they found at the dig site was things like um, the palace, the temple that, that was in Sodom. This is a huge city. They, they boasted of over 50,000 people for almost 3,000 years lived at this location. This is not, we think of Sodom in the Bible, when we, when we think about it, we think of some kind of like little village and maybe, you know, uh, and, and the angels are coming in and, and, and Lot's like, no, 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 don't do this. This is a big town. This is a metropolis. This was a bustling metropolis. Moses even talks about it in Genesis 13 when he's describing this as he's the writer of Genesis, that, and you remember where Moses was raised. Moses was raised in Egypt, and he even says in Genesis 13 of Sodom, when he's talking about Lot and, and Abraham separating, that it was so lush, it was like the valley on the way to Egypt, right? And this is what you had here. This palace they had was almost four and a half, five stories tall. When I'm talking about four and a half meter thick walls each meter is about three feet so you're talking about almost 10 or 12 foot thick walls and it was destroyed by what scientists call a, an, a cosmic air burst event similar to the one that happened in siberia in 1908 leveled 25 kilometers you know a whole town about the size of panama city maybe uh, they're talking about now they found walls around the perimeter and what's so interesting there's even mention of a bench inset into the gate of sodom why is that interesting genesis 19 1 when the two angels came from sodom in the evening and lot was sitting in the gate of sodom not on the gate or near the gate in the gate and yet, inside the gate walls, in archaeologically, and nowadays, they've unearthed and dug up a bench that was inset into the wall. So now you can see where Lot would have been sitting. <clears throat> and this was happened. Uh, this air burst event took place around about 1650 BC. Everything about the detail of the event explains perfectly with the right detail, the right time, and the right location of all the events that happened in Scripture. This is consistent with the biblical event. Uh, they can even tell you that the, the cosmic air burst is basically either an asteroid, they figure, or some kind of meteor that came in, and as it came in, it just exploded at the rate that it was coming in, and it was so hot it burned up everything. And they even said that the, the angle that it came in was a 25-degree angle, and it destroyed everything that it touched, uh, even to the point where, where there was um, human remains, skeletal remains, like behind the wall of, of, of the palace, and it, where the, the elements came in and burned up everything above, there was half of a skeleton left, 
and the other half was gone, destroyed to that degree. One scientist thought that maybe uh, the, the dig site was compromised because they found a, a glass, uh, they found a, a piece of pottery that on one side had a glazing on it. And he said, well, we don't have this kind of pottery um, unless, you know, until about 1000 BC. And so they think that someone might have compromised the site, except when he turned it over, the backside showed that it was a Bronze Age period piece. So they sent it off to the site and they said, well, what you have here is actually a piece of the lab. The lab came back and said, this piece was actually, is a Bronze Age piece. The reason why the top is glazed is because uh, this is what we call, um, I, I forget the name of it, but um, it's the same thing that happens when a nuclear bomb goes off. It melts the sand at such fervent heat that it turns it into a piece of glass. And this is what happened. This was a 2000 degree Celsius event. Uh, most of the scientists on this site are uh, not religious. They're not Christian. They're not even uh, Jewish. They're just secular scientists, most of them. And especially the ones that did the laboratory work for the piece I was just describing, they were nearly all secular scientists. And so you go, well, what's, what's the point of all that? Why are you bringing it up now? We're not even talking about Sodom and Gomorrah in here. Um, I think as believers, this bolsters us, right? It helps you go and to hear that news and you go, wow, this is so refreshing to know that my faith is rooted in truth, right? I know that it's, it's backed by God and the power of our faith now is rooted in truth. It's not just a, a blind faith where we take some step off the dock and we hope that we land on something. Uh, the unbeliever and the atheist, uh, this information likely will not convince them. Um, it proves in their mind only that someone may have been on the hillside witnessing it from afar, and they go, oh, I know what happened. I'll write down this little story and make up why I think this event happened. The gods must be angry. And there we go. They're going to say, well, this is some kind of a fairy tale. To a skeptic, the archaeological findings here do not prove the Bible. It proves that, any, that an event happened. But every human is called by God to believe the words of God or to be judged. You're not really called to try and find out if the Bible is true. And Jesus' words were interesting uh, about this in Luke 17. I'm going to read a couple of them real quick. And he's talking about, coincidence enough, the event with Sodom. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating and drinking, and they were buying, and they were selling, and they were building, and they were planting. But on that day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and burning sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day of the Son of Man that the Son of Man is revealed. So today, the, the bar is even higher. Because at that day, we, we have Jesus now. They were just learning of Jesus. And so they might have thought he was just a blasphemer. But we have the full revelation of his word. And Jesus often repeated this warning to someone who didn't believe. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So the Bible doesn't equivocate on it. It doesn't ask you, go out and prove that these things are true, then believe, and then you're going to be saved. He gives you the information and, and commands, demands that you believe Him. In Matthew 12, Jesus said, The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment, and, it will con and will condemn it because it has repented the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater is here. The point is not to cast stones at anyone.
But what I'm trying to do is bring the, the ship around to bear down on the truth. The scripture is not here to prove God's existence. We don't preach to prove the Bible is God's word. The statements of Jesus are author authoritative. We either believe them or we do not. That's the point of me bringing up Sodom. Because that was the question that reigned in my mind. No pun intended. I'll get Robert. <laughs> He's rubbing off on me, I'm telling you. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we either believe that the God's word is what it says, or we don't. And our text reminds us in John 17 that the world does not know God. Verse 21 proved that last week. That's why we're being sent. That's why we're here. It's our job then to tell the world. Look at what it says in verse 21. That they may all believe, they may be one, even as you and Father are in me and I in them, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's the point of our faith. And I'll have a lot more to say about that coming up in a minute. So this prayer then, in John 17, is comforting. It's mind-blowing. All the things that we've talked about, the relationship between the Father and the Son, the Father loving the Son in all eternity to the point where He made the Son a gift, a love gift, to give to the Son. And we talked about how Islam doesn't have that because it reigns uh, fear of Allah is what moves them or motivates them. We have a similar fear of the Lord that's a reverence and a respect, but we also understand with the Trinity that we see the love that existed before the foundation of the world, before we were created, before we were thought of, the love that was in perfect union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we see this prayer of Christ as mind-blowing. The depths of it are... Uh, we can't plumb far enough to understand all the things that Christ is saying here. We just don't have eyes to see that. But we're getting a glimpse here, and we're understanding what our marching orders are from it. And that's kind of what I want us to understand today, because there's more than just the power to believe in some uh, that we have some way to paradise, Right? This is not what this is about. We're not just here to figure out how to get in. And that's always what you see. The um, Everyone who came to Jesus, that was always the question on their mind. How do I get in? How do I get in? So today we're going to look at that because it's more than just a ticket into paradise. So let's go ahead and read our verses real quick. We're just going to, we're going to close up the end here, reading these six verses. Verse 22, John 17, verse 22, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, have, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. First thing I want you to see out of verse 22 is this is more than a religion. Right? This is more than a ticket to paradise. My secular mind just kicked in there for a second. Sorry. Um, my secular raised mind. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. Uh, this is eternal unity. Verse 22. The glory you gave me, I gave to them. He gave to them this glory. That glory that he has. Right? And, and why? Why? For what purpose? That they may be one even as we are one. What does that mean? That we may be one even as they are one. 
like I said, we, we can't really understand what this means because we, weren't, we don't have those eyes to see the Trinity in all of its glory, right? We don't know what it was like before we existed, and we don't even really know what it's like in heaven now while we exist. We have some key pieces of information that the Scriptures tell us, but we don't really know because we don't have that kind of unity here, do we? We don't have unity at all among men. You look around the world and you see disunity everywhere. It's constant from different age groups, generations, or, or cultures, and time. Division among everyone. Uh, political divisions. All kinds of animosity and hatred toward each other. If you don't believe something about uh, one group and you could be friends with someone, you'll be cut off. And sometimes... It's hurtful because you've been friends with people for dozens and dozens of years. Matter of fact, I just realized I had a memory pop up on my Facebook um, from a friend who I hung out with uh, that I've known since I was 15 years old. We're really, really good friends. Only to find out that now we're no longer friends. I know his family is atheistic and he's put up with me for quite a long time, but I guess that's over. We're no longer friends. It's a little sad. But the division is there. And you see racism of all kinds. You see thievery of all kinds. You see all kinds of adultery, murder, love of self. Uh, one of my friends, uh, and, and one thing I love about the Christian faith is it brings together ethnicities of all kinds, right? There, there is none of that racism. And, and I see friends who are getting married and, and they're all on, and I don't know, some of them, they're, you know, they're all over the world and it's just really, it's just wonderful actually to see them and in, in their unions together. But the world as a, as, a, as a whole doesn't really have that kind of unity. But in heaven, we have that kind of unity. In Christ, we have that kind of unity. In heaven, the Trinity has that unity. The Trinity's always had that unity. The Trinity has never for a split second not had that unity. Even when Jesus cried out on the cross, that was a momentarily, uh, when he was feeling the, the, the human side of him endure the wrath of God, which the, the, the Son of God had never felt. And in his humanness, he cries out, My God, why have you forsaken me? But never for a second were they actually separated. Some people teach that. Jesus was separated from God because he was no longer divine in that moment and he gave up his divinity in such a way that he could be human and take on our sin. That, that's, that's a false teaching. Jesus was always God, is always God, will always be God. There was never for a second, if he even ceased to be God, even for a split second, this whole world would collapse. And even among the angels, there's unity. And you say, well, not always. And that's true. But guess what happened to the angels that rebelled? They weren't allowed in heaven anymore, were they? You're out. We're not going to have that kind of disunity here. They were thrown down. So Jesus here is illuminating our minds. He's giving us understanding that unifies the believers of all kinds. In Christ, we have unity. We have brotherhood. That's why when you, you can be meeting a new Christian and you just go, man, there's, I feel like there's something that connects us. You know, such a love for each other. Because you start talking about Jesus and your love for Christ and your love for God and how He saved you from where you once were. And then they're talking about how Jesus saved them from where they once were. And all of a sudden, there's this bond. And you're just like, wow, I feel like I've known you forever. Because you have Christ in you. We're one family. We're one race, as I was saying. And Christianity has done more to bring that together. 
I want to play for you a video that I found. I kind of made, but I, I, it reminded me of um, of this very thing. Uh, one time, I was watching one of my favorite preachers, Justin Peters. This is not his video, but I um, I, I put together this video because I couldn't find it, and I just remembered. So he went to the Ukraine, and and he was talking. And he's if you know him, he's kind of uh, stuck to a wheelchair. Uh, to a degree, he can walk with some crutches, but he's got cerebral, um, what's it called? Cerebral palsy. Yeah, cerebral palsy, and he can't really walk too well. So anyway, uh, they had lifted him up, and but the video showed them singing songs that we sing. So I want to play this so you guys can get an idea of that unity that I'm talking about. And it, it's kind of touching, it touched me when I saw the different uh, nationalities, and they're all singing the same songs that we sing. And it's just beautiful. Go ahead and play it, Brendan. That's just an. I just wanted to illuminate that to your mind to let you see that that unity that we have with people that live so far away from us. We'll never see them likely in our life, but we have that connection with them. We're going to see all those people probably in heaven. We'll be singing right side by side with them. We'll be worshiping side by side, elbow to elbow, worshiping the Creator of the universe. This is the unity that we have with them. We have forgiveness against faults of all manners. We have provision from others, others helping others. That's what, that's what the, the first century church was marked by. They were moved by God to help others, and they were giving freely. That's why they were giving their land away. And then, of course, Ananias and Sapphira said to come in and try to make a big deal about that, and we know what God thought about that. The purity of the church, and we've talked about this before in our, in our messages, in evangelism. The purity of the church comes first. But all kinds of protections come from the church. Healing and binding up each other's wounds, as James 5 talks about. If any of you is sick, go to the elders of the church and have your wounds bound up. And, and all that kind of stuff is for persecutions and whatnot, for preaching the word. No longer are we just believers isolated on like a little desert island. Think about many people that you might know that, that don't have any sense of community with anyone. In the secular world, you have to go out and join a group to become part of someone. You have to show up on Wednesdays over here to play with so-and-so, some board game or whatever, to get some sort of camaraderie. But with Christ, when you're in Christ, that's built in, right? Right? That's built in. We're bonded eternally. This is why I say these things about when we have our communion services. This is what I'm trying to illustrate. In the secular world, you have to uh, have 
some bonding through maybe a high school or a college football team or, or the school that you went to or some kind of career path that you've chosen. And that's the kind of unity that you have with them. And it's very fleeting, very superficial. And think about people who have absolutely no one. Right? They have no one. So this is more than just a religion. It's more than that. We're more than a church building. Look at verse 23. I and them and you and me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them. We'll get to that. Yes, we worship in truth. We teach the truth. In all of our printed materials, we, I try to make sure that everything that we have in this church is rooted in truth. The classes that we have, the, the, the outreaches that we have into the community are rooted in truth. <clears throat> but we're being perfected in love towards unity for a purpose. Flip over to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. Because we're being equipped for something. Ephesians 4, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. The church was, I'm going to back up a little bit, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We're not going to exposit all those words and that, those two verses, but just enough to understand that you're being built up and look at verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of faith. You are all supposed to be building up, maturing, and growing. This is not, and I said something, someone said something the other day about, uh, this morning I saw a thing on K-Love's Facebook page. Hey, let's all get strong or whatever, and let's all stand boldly for Christ. And I said, great, how about we start with um, getting rid of some of the fluffy Christian music and some of the watching the chosen TV show, which is very superficial and has some kind of a, a weird uh, hippie Jesus kind of a deal. And why don't we stand for truth and, and be ready and, and being, instead of being thrown around by every wind of doctrine that, that puts Jesus' name on the end of it. Because what it's doing is it's making a, a, a very soft, church and i'm talking about not our church i'm talking about a national church a the visible church they're very very soft they're very compromising they're very weak and they're very just oh not today satan not not you're not going to get me and i understand there's times when we need that but i'm talking about as a this is their philosophy for their way of life their christianity is worked out in this way you should be stronger than that these guys that we talked about going in James, going and praying for the elders, they're preaching the gospel that they're being persecuted. And so when they come into the church, they're being battered and bruised. And so we should be the same. But you've got to be strong enough to be out there preaching the word. And most people don't preach the word or talk to their friends about it because they don't feel like they got the answers. How am I gonna, what am I going to say if someone says this? And I, I don't know how to respond to that, so I'm just not going to say a whole lot. And you end up just kind of sitting on the sidelines. And you, got, and you let a guy, and I'm not meaning to say you, but like people just let you, the, the preacher do the work. Well, I'll bring him to church and whatever. And maybe that guy, will, you know, preacher was doing good today, man. He was on fire. Uh, he'll, he'll give it to him. And that's fine if you don't know. But you should be knowing. You should be growing. This is what Paul is saying in Ephesians 4. I don't mean to be so worked up and you know, getting on everyone about it, but I'm just trying to help you understand. We're here for more than just a ticket to heaven. We're here for more than just a church service. We don't come just because it's Sunday or because it's Wednesday night. 
We come because we're being grown to maturity. Look at Paul's words, verse 13, until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And I know and I trust God that when you trust and put your faith in Christ, I don't need to yell at you guys to get you motivated. I know and I trust that God will do that. I'm just trying to help encourage you to let him have that work. As James says, let those trials come. Let those moments of pain and suffering come because they bring endurance. They bring patience. They bring the gifts of the Spirit, which I love in Galatians 5.22 and on. It talks about the peace, the joy, the, the loving kindness, the gentleness to speak truth. And that's what we see in verse 15. It's to bring you to the point where you, uh, this is still in Ephesians, but speaking truth and love. You can only do that if you're out there speaking the truth. And it's only out there when you're out there and then you're confronting error. If you're given the opportunity to confront error, you find it and you take it. And it doesn't mean you stand there with a sign on the curb that says, you're all going to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. But we have way more opportunities than we realize, and we could help lovingly bring spiritual, true spiritual edification and maturity to someone. We don't need to be necessarily confrontational, I mean like emotionally charged. So let's go back to John and remember why you're sent. And our perfection there is not to make us superior. And that's all what I was talking about. He is constantly perfecting us. Jesus is praying for that. He's praying for them to be perfected, verse 23. And in unity. But for what reason? That you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Listen. The reason why we are growing in this way is so that we'll remember why we were sent. And that should give us direction. That should let us know what we're doing. Motivation. That's the correct way that we should be thinking about this perfection of ours. It's not just so we can say, hands off Satan or the demons, you know, we're not going to take your influence. Yeah, we get that. But that the world may know that you sent me and notice this, that the Father loved them. Loved them as He loves Jesus. I think about the the rabbinical story. I, I, I may get some of the details wrong on this, but uh, one of my favorites because it, it, it shined a light for me, especially on people that I don't agree with, <clears throat> that the rabbis talk about uh, how conversation between God and Gabriel or the angels in heaven when Egypt was destroyed or uh, the Egyptian army was destroyed and they're crossing the river behind Moses, right? And they're coming after Moses and the Israelites and then the waters close in when the Moses and the Israelites are on the other side and the waters close in and destroys the Egyptian army and the angels roar in heaven and rejoice and they start saying, wow, good, good job, man. That was awesome. Glad to see those guys, you know, whatever, some ad-libbing now. <laughs> But the idea is, God says, don't, don't rejoice in the destruction of God's creation. They're image bearers, just like we are. So there's no, there's, there shouldn't be a sense of superiority in us as far as believers to think that we're on some elite level that maybe someone who's not saved and in the gutter isn't, they just haven't got it yet, or they're obviously not figured it out. So there's more to this religion, there's more to the church, there's more to us. There's more to this love than just a ticket to get in. And that's the big question on the world's mind, isn't it? Is heaven real and how do I get there if it is? And there are question now that doesn't really even involve God so much. They don't really 
God doesn't really have to be there. I mean, they just want to get to heaven if, if he's there or not. I mean, you see a lot of the movies. Uh, what was that movie? What Dreams May Come? It was kind of a cool movie, I thought, before I was saved. Uh, you know, an interesting version of things. But you notice what was missing? There's angels. Everyone's having a good time. Give or take, if you remember the movie. But very dark movie in a way. But, but what was missing from that movie? God. There was no God in heaven. There was no evidence of God being in that movie, but yet they were in heaven and they talked about God. They referenced God a few times, but there was no God in heaven. And I think the world is happy to go to heaven without God. They're happy to, they just want to get there if it's real. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm a good guy and I'll be okay if I can just get there. They just want to slide in. That's their hope. Whatever it turns out to be, they don't really know, they don't really care. Of course, we say not all of them are like that, but, but the believer understands, and, and we hope for more. We, hope, we know that there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no broken promises, there's no more lies, there's no more deception, no hate, right? And murder. I read this week about a high school young man in high school who followed his teacher after school was over to the restroom with a box cutter and killed her so he could be with her sexually. We know that's not going to happen in heaven. We don't have to fear in heaven. We have no fear of death. We have no regret in heaven. There's nothing for us to lose. We don't have to worry about being abused in heaven. There's no more sin. That's why we look forward to heaven so much. Uh, the, I said last week, I think um, that's one of the things that a believer, as you get older and the more you mature in your faith, and that has nothing to do with age, by the way, the more you mature in your faith, the more you are affected by sin. And when you have sin in your life, it just runs you down with guilt. The more you mature in your faith, you'll sin less, but the more, if you do, it just crushes you, the weight of that sin. Because why? Because you understand how holy God is. And that's what we long for, the, the absence of sin in heaven. And why? Because we are in the presence of of Christ. Remember, we said that uh, heaven is not a, uh, a chronological event as we kind of think about it. We think of he uh, heaven as eternal life, and that goes on forever, right? And it, and it does. But Jesus' description, he's talking about an eternal present moment. Think of the joy of a new, sweet life. The joy that you have when a baby comes into the world. Everyone knows that, right? When you have a child, you understand that moment and that total, you know, Jesus said when the, when the, the childbearing and the pain comes and that moment is all of that is forgotten when the baby arrives. Because when the baby's there, the, you understand nothing but total joy. The new sweetness of life has entered the world. This is that ever-present moment in heaven that we have with our Savior. It's an unending moment. So when we look at verse 24, and Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. We have a little bit more of an understanding of that now, don't we? He wants us to not only be in heaven, but listen, what does He say? He doesn't say, Father, I desire also that they come to heaven. I desire also that they are able to get to heaven. He says, no. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, be with Me. He wants you to be with him for that unending eternal moment with Christ. 
guys, this is starting to run long. So um, I got more to say. I might have to make it one more week. I don't want to do this to you again. Uh, I don't want to drag it on because I got a little bit more to say. Uh, so I'm just going to end it there. Let's let's. I, I just want you to understand how powerful this prayer really is. There's so much going on there. It's so deep, and it should be encouraging. But it's to get us to move out. But you can't move out until you've matured, right? That's the process. No one gets the car keys without learning how to drive first, right? You got to grow. And, and you don't get the car keys until you've got it figured out. Mom and dad aren't be giving the car keys out uh, when you got a lot of stuff going on in your life that maybe, and I, I was heard, I remember the one preacher who said, uh, you know, if you spit in your mom's face, you're not going to be rowing the car later in the day, right? you got some stuff to talk about. If you have issues with God like that, you're not going to be getting all these wonderful glories until you got that conversation with God out of the way. But it's not just a one-time, out-of-the-way conversation. It's a continual life, giving of yourself, dying to yourself, your desires out the window, Christ's desires in. And then comes the growth. And if you're in a church, I, I, I pray like ours and somewhere where people can mature and grow and you can be ready to begin to go out there and do the things and help the people around you that need the help and have the mind to see it and have the eyes to see those opportunities arise in your life. Well, let's pray.